Well, we were discussing uh, this end of the morning, this way of trying to learn something about the this system. We've talked about a thought. Now, the core of the system is really thought, though it involves everything, <laughs> and the uh, the way it works. Uh, how uh, with all sorts of emotional disturbances, such as anger, you could first of all use the words find the words which will stir it up so as to, you can then get something to observe, uh, to see, learn about the relationship between the word, the thought, and the, the and the, all that follows the feeling and the state of the body and so on. And, uh, and of course in doing that you're suspending the anger, I say, holding it in front of you rather than it's not that strong that you feel you absolutely must express it, nor are you keeping it hidden, right? <laughs> you see, so uh, therefore you're able to see this process and learn something about it. So you're beginning to get acquainted with the system, right? Hmm. How it really works. If you don't have that element of thought in there, or language, then you don't see the system because the core of it is missing, right? You see something happening, and then you say, that's the typical attitude, and the next thought comes along and says, there's something happening, independent of thought and you get caught in that same fault again, right? So, you see, the point is you've got to be seeing that it's actually <coughs> happening, right? The thought is behind this system, <laughs> Otherwise, the system seems to stand by itself, independent of thought. Like, if you take a company, any company like General Motors, it's entirely organized by thinking that it exists and has a certain structure, right? And uh, except for that thought, it wouldn't exist. Unless people believed it existed, it wouldn't exist, you see, and uh, they wouldn't, they'd have all the factories and everything else, but they wouldn't know what they're supposed to be doing <laughs> or how they're supposed to be related or anything. So the thought is at the core of it, right? And the, uh, that there's a whole system, you know, which develops out of that. And the, uh, we want to be able to see this system in operation, so we have to have it there in front of us to see it <laughs> and uh, suspend it. And then, the, other, the second point about the use of language is after you see something, then you should also put it in words what you have seen, right? Right, because you want to inform the thought process of what you have seen, right? And you see what I mean? <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you may see something and the thought process doesn't know about it, so it will just go on as before. <laughs> uh, so the thought process doesn't see, right? It can only get information from, uh, a typical way of getting information is from words, right? You see, on such an abstract level anyway. Hmm. So, uh, therefore, uh, it's essential uh, to say we use words to elicit this thing, to make it visible, and also we then may use words to state what, it, what we have seen, right? But it's not, not to do it the other way around, to say, this is the way it is and then I see it, you see. <laughs> That, that also can be done, <laughs> and uh, that leads to trouble, right, or illusion, so, which I'm going to discuss, you know, as we go along. So, uh, that, so that, that is a, a, a key point. Now, uh, maybe we could have five minutes of, if we wish to discuss all this before going ahead to another point, if you wish. Uh. I'm going to take this a little deeper, if I may. I'm aware now that my conditioning makes me feel the way I feel because of um, looking outside of me for what I feel and blaming the people that I yell. With. And I'm looking at it. And then, lo and behold, right next to that feeling, I see that I'm a very serviceable person. Up to now, I believe that I service people with all my love because this is what I learned from my mother, and I really, really love it. Now, I'm even starting to question that. Yeah. Am I doing it because I'm afraid I'm going to displease people and they may end up yelling at me? Oh. Or am I doing it to be liked? Yes, yeah, so I think you have to sort of look at all that. You know, that's the, those details are things that really you have to look at for yourself, you see. I think that what I would suggest is that whoever is interested in this should, from time to time, especially when they're by themselves, uh, inquire into just that sort of question. You see, hmm? you see that. See, that's what we call the homework, <laughs> and the uh, um, th that's part of it anyway. And 
the uh, 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 so that for whenever you have time and are so inclined, then you can ask questions like that and try to find the answer in the same way as before <coughs> by observation, right? Mm. You see, it's no use to, for somebody else to tell you uh, because, you know, that, that will be very superficial. Hmm? Not that I expect an answer, but I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, if the chemistry of the body and the mind work together in thought, and up to now, before my realizing my conditioning, they've been working pretty smoothly as far as they were concerned. Now, I'm changing my attitude. All of a sudden, the brain and the body say, hey, what's going on here? That's not what we're used to. And I'm getting a reaction, I'm feeling a reaction of their confusion, if it is that, of the chemistry imbalance. And it could be depression or fear. And that would give me choices either to escape, go back to the way it was, mm -hmm. call a friend, raid the refrigerator, take a pill or whatever, or stay with what it brings yeah. me to give the system, if it's depression or fear, if I can stay with it without finding an escape, is, is that the adjustment that the body needs chemically, and this is the symptoms I'm receiving that they look negative to me, to sort of straighten their problem out, and then, uh, there's something else that takes place, uh, uh, some kind of lightness, some kind of uh, mm. freedom, some kind of something else that uh, if I didn't let it stay, I would block what was there. If my condition was to eliminate the terrific fear of confusion that I'm mm -hmm. Yes, well, I think all of that is the sort of thing you have to do, you see, but you, you see, that I think that that much detail we can't do here, you see, in, in the group. We have to, in the group, we have to get the general notion, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, this is not really an encounter group, you know, one of those therapeutic groups where they might go into that sort of detail, do you understand? Uh, there are groups which actually try to work that way. Uh, yes, you have a question. I, I would like to know when you were talking at the beginning, are you saying that with words, <coughs> We bring out memory, and memory is making objective. By using the word, we're objectifying the memory, and we can see. No, we are bringing by using the word, not only bringing out the memory, but we're producing the actual state which we are, tr are trying to explore, right? Such as anger. See, we find the words which will bring up that previous anger that is still simmering, you've forgotten about it perhaps, but it's still there on the uh, reflexes. Hmm. And it's ready to spring again into action any time when something happens. Hmm. But instead of waiting for something to happen, you, because if it happens, it'll happen so fast you may not get a look at it. Hmm. You have time to look at it. You, you will have, if you bring it up by words, you'll have time to look at it, but the main thing you'll have, one of the big things you have time to look at is that the words are doing it. Right? If the words were not there, you, you would miss the main point. <laughs> Do you see? Hmm? Thank you. That means thought is doing it, basically. The words represent thought, right? Hmm? So when we're thinking we're not using words, are, if we're thinking we're not using words, are we, are we still using words, but we're just missing the fact that we're using them? Or are it's, we thinking in some kind of another language? That's there there may be another language, that, that, you know, there may be an image language, there's an implicit thought, which, uh, you see, the, it goes without saying, if, you know, if uh, whenever uh, anything like this happens, I've got to react in this way, right? That's the thought. Now, instead it just reacts. Huh? That's still, as you remember, the thought spreads out into all the other reflexes, so the thought is still going on in another form. For example, if I wrote it out on paper, it would still be the thought, but in another form, right? Hmm? It can take many, many forms. It could be put on a television set, it could be carried by radio waves, right? It can be carried by all the reflexes, you see. They're all part of that thought. There are different forms of that one thought. Hmm? Is that clear what I mean? You have, it's very important to see this, that this thought goes out and spreads over the world all over through radio waves and other people pick it up and they get their reflexes. Hmm? So, 
So it's all thought. Now, the point is that the words are a way of bringing the thought into evidence, right? Whereas often it works implicitly without your being aware of it. Hmm? See, if you respond to somebody, you have a reflex that food of that kind disgusts you, and you, you will just get a sense of disgust. But it could have happened by some sort of uh, words, couldn't it, in very early childhood. Hmm? So, uh, therefore, but that's still thought, even though that expression of disgust is basically thought, because that's what pr controls it, that's what makes it happen. Hmm? It's on there on the reflexes. I wonder if you see what I mean? Yes, I think so. You see, so thought spreads all over the place in many, many different forms. We're just not aware of it, you're saying. Yeah, but we're not aware of it partly because of our culture, which tells us that thought is only intellectual, right? And therefore, it's no use looking at this other stuff. Hmm. So we might become aware of it if it weren't for that. So by doing that, we can really focus and see our real intention, not what we're telling ourselves. Well, we can see what is really happening, and that is happening is producing a part of our intention, right? You see, if there's a valid, necessary reason to be angry, then, or to do, I say, to, to be impelled to do something, then you will get that intention out of the thought, right? See, if you say it's necessary for me to do my job, right, you find yourself getting the intention to do it. Hmm? Hmm? You see, the intention can flow out of the thought, so the intention is still part of the thought. Hmm? I'm wondering, if you said that you need to um, put into words, you know, like what you've understood, and then communicate it to the thought process, how does that keep from becoming another system? Or it, it does go in, it, there is danger that it will happen, but see, we're going to have to discuss later, what, you know, how this, you know, may happen, you see, what, what could be done with this. Uh, but we're saying that it is necessary, the, the thought process will not know what has been seen without some sort of way of translating it into thought, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, this is one of the ideas to bring out the assumptions that are already in the thoughts. Yeah. Them. So it's, it, it won't harm that much if they go back, they are there already. Well, we're bringing out the assumption and we may then form a new reflex and make a habit of it and so on, we could go wrong again. but. Saying we're we're going into it so that we're you know we're just learning about it now. You see, we're not trying to actually change it. That's the crucial point. If we start once think we're trying to change it, then we get into all the tangle of questions. But we're saying whatever happens is grist for the mill. You see, if if that happens, you can learn about that. Hmm. I I uh, a lot of times I look at it the other way around that the thoughts come out of the intentions that we may not be aware of. But then, it seems a little strange to me to put the emphasis on the thought. Well, because many of our thoughts are ref uh, intentions are reflexive. They just come out automatically. And they're coming from reflexes, which whose basis is thought. You see, the intention is implicit in the thought. You will be impelled to do something if something is necessary. If somebody says, you, you must do it, you know, it's necessary to do it, it's necessary, or doing this will give you something you really want, right? the thought, then you will get the intention to do it. Right? See, we, we have this picture that there's somebody inside who is given all this information and then decides to have the intention to do it, right? I'm trying to say, I'm suggesting that is not so, generally speaking. But I'm thinking of cases where the person, for some reason, has to do something and then will generate thoughts that justify it. That I see. Well, that's the next, the next step, you see. He may have one thought saying, I must do this. He has another thought saying, it would be wrong to do it. And he gets a third thought, which uh, justifies it anyway, right? Hmm. You see, the whole thing is one reflex after another. <laughs> you see, I think we have to see this system just working, working, working. <laughs> Now, in, and somehow intelligence can come in there and get out of this, but I'm saying that as long as the system works, you don't know what's happening any more than why, why your leg should jump when you touch the, that bone. <laughs> hmm? So basically you're saying that the system is working by itself, reflexively, mechanically, but it gives the impression that there's a me, a center. Yeah, the system contains a reflex producing the thought that it is I who am doing it. You see, we'll have to go, we'll go into that. You see that it has a very elaborate system of covering up what's happening. 
so uh, uh, and this will take some time to go into, you see. That, that, you see, uh, and that I think we should go on from there, because nobody has any urgent question. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, you see, we have a, I wanted to say more about thought. Uh, you see, thought is incomplete. It doesn't cover, if the thought of a table doesn't cover all about the table. It, it picks up a few points about it clearly. <laughs> It has vast numbers of things like the atomic constitution, all sorts of structure inside, how it's all related to everything. You see, it's a simplification or an abstraction, we say. But one way of looking at it is to say thought provides a representation of what you're thinking about. Like the artist makes a picture who rep which represents somebody, but it isn't somebody at all. It's just sometimes a few little lines are enough to represent that person, but clearly the person is far more than that, right? He has an immense amount in there, which is not in the representation. And uh, the, uh, so, uh, therefore, thought does not provide a complete picture or account or information about any, the thing it's supposed to be about, right? Hmm? When we take, for example, the thought of the table, it has only a few salient features. And also, it's somewhat ambiguous. See, a lot of different, the thought of table includes a lot of possible things that might be tables. <laughs> even little, all sorts of strange shapes and sizes, or occasionally something would come along that you wouldn't expect to be used as a table. <laughs> you see, so it's constantly adding different forms and shapes and so on. So the word table it calls up a representation in your mind, probably of an image of some sort of table, that you, you know, your typical table. <laughs> and then there are all sorts of forms it could take, so you see this object is this. Immediately, the, if an object fits one of, uh, is somewhere either those forms or somewhere between those forms or similar to those forms or in some vague way even, then it might call up the, the notion of table, right? <laughs> or the word table. Hmm? And they're all put together. Hmm? And uh, the thing is then that you have that, y you can see that that's a kind of reflex. You see, when you look at this, there's a reflex in your mind. You don't actually utter the word table, but there's a, a potential reflex that's a table, right? Hmm? If somebody to ask you, you immediately say that's a table. Hmm? So uh, the information is there in your mind already, already, already on tap, isn't it? So therefore, the the thing is recognized by uh, by the fact that it would fit that representation, right? It would be one of the possible forms of that representation. Is that clear? And the, any form of that will operate the reflex. Is that hmm? is that clear? What I'm driving at. So and therefore you recognize it, hmm? or when you think about it. You can then uh, think of all the things that are attributed to it and associated to it and, and so on, and, and connect up to other reflexes and so on. Hmm? See, everything you think about is this connected to reflexes which will be involved what you can do with it. For example, this table, the representation of the table in your mind is connected to reflexes with what you can do to the table, or you can put things on it and so on, so that you are already automatically ready to put something on there if necessary. Hmm? Right? You see, so you see how it's all connected up, and, and the um, that the intellectual reflexes and the visual reflexes and the emotional and the physical and the chemical and everything are all connected up, so that you are ready immediately to take action, unless it turns out that it's not a table and it won't do what you expect, and then you say it's incoherent, and if your mind is working right, you say something is wrong. We've got to change something, right? Mm. You see. So that's the way thought works, is that clear? It gives you a vast amounts of connected information, interrelated, connected, logically related information. Also with all sorts of ways of, op it's sort of open, the symbol is not as ambiguous. See, the word table is the symbol, right? <laughs> Which, whose meaning is ambiguous, so that it can add all sorts of other things in it. It has a tremendous potential for connecting things up. Is that, see, you could say, that the earliest thoughts before there was language would probably involve images. See, if somebody raised that question, that the child before the child can use words probably uses vaguely defined images to stand in for the things it's thinking about. Hmm. For example, animals will see a, a part of an object and expect the whole, and so will very young children. Therefore, it seems clear that a, a part of the object can call up the whole, or objects that are similar, or vaguely similar, could call up, up the whole class and so on. So, uh, that makes a reflex, uh, so that that symbol is a, 
uh, makes a new reflex which connects all the other reflexes. Is that clear? Every one of these objects that the symbol can stand in for has in itself a set of reflexes of what you can do with it, right? And that symbol connects that all, right? It's another reflex which connects all those reflexes. So you begin to see thought organizing into a very complex, rich structure. See, when it's working right, it can do all that. Hmm? Hmm? I've hardly begun to touch on it because it, it goes on to thought, to logic, to reason. You can form very abstract uh, symbols. For example, we talked today about the symbol of necessity and contingency, the two words, right? Now they can stand, if you ask what are they, you can't imagine what they are, right? <laughs> words, you have no picture of what is necessity or what is contingency. <laughs> but uh, you can say, but you have a vast number of things which uh, those will connect up with, right? And any time you want to bring order into what you're seeing, that's one of the things you've got to do, is to uh, sort out what's necessary and what's contingent in this particular situation. Hmm? Right? Or another uh, set of very abstract things is the general and the particular. The general is the reflex of inclusive, and the particular, uh, you know, is, 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 uh, narrows it down, right? And you treat this, ta you treat things by the general and the particular. You say that, you know, this table is something general, but it particularly is made of wood. It is uh, a certain shape. It's right here, and so on, and so on. You see, so that also is all worked out. You know, and, and, and there are a vast number of things, you know, so if, if you were to try to find out how all this thought process works, you could probably spend a lifetime <laughs> uh, and still not get there. But <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, so uh, I only say this to show that there is a lot to thought that is, not, that is not the culprit. You see, the thought is not just pure wickedness, <laughs> uh, but that uh, the, uh, you have this whole structure, which is very subtle and very complex and so on, and uh, which we probably know very little about and uh, uh, does everything for us. And, but it has gone, you know, it has this flaw in it, right? This, this thought is part of a system which includes all our reflexes, our relations to other people, our, all that we do, all our society and everything. Hmm? So, uh, now, this thought then it works by a representation, right? In other words, that we, by a symbol and by a representation, right? You see, a symbol stands in for the thing. A word is a symbol, is that? Hmm? You can use uh, images as symbols, simplified images, right? The Chinese ideographic language came from originally pictures and they were simplified finally and became mere symbols, right? Hmm? But then the, 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 the uh, Alphabetic symbol is still more powerful because it has no need have no resemblance whatsoever to what it represents. It's far more flexible. Eh? Mm -hmm. So uh, therefore, that's that was the power of language. You see, now the, you have you have all those symbols, and the symbol produces a representation which might be something which sort of stand, which sort of it presents it again, as it were, gives you a sort of a feeling for it. Right? For example, you may have seen if you take a represent a human face by a circle with uh, two dots and a little triangle for the nose. And then the mouth, if the mouth is curved up, it represents a smiling, happy person. If the mouth is curved down, it represents somebody who's unhappy and frowning, right? So you, you, if you look at that, you will get a feeling in there as a smiling, happy person or a frowning person, you see. <laughs> uh, you see, so that is the kind of representation of the meaning of, of the thing, you see. Hmm? So, uh, now, you have to keep all that in mind. You see that uh, representations can get more and more detailed, become more like artist's pictures. They may be diagrams, they may be blueprints, they may be uh, all sorts of things, right? Hmm? And that's all thought taking different forms, right? Hmm? See, every one of those things is thought, right? Hmm? So, this level below the verbal, yeah, that's another system of symbols. Yes, pictures, it, perhaps. Is that pictures or lines or you know very simplified pictures or blobs or even or something hardly just enough there to stand in right, <laughs> for something. And you see, and, uh, it would seem to me that a child uh, who doesn't yet talk could probably do a lot of quite a bit of thinking through that. And uh, you know, for example, a child has to learn that objects which disappear behind, according to Piaget, the psychologist. That, the object disappears behind a, 
something and then reappears, he claims that it acts as if it thought that the object had vanished and a new object had appeared. At some stage he learns that it's the same object, but he, he needs a symbol for that, he doesn't yet talk, right? So he must have a sort of vague picture of a blob. He doesn't have to have the exact picture of the object, that would be a nuisance, right? <laughs> Uh, <coughs> so, to make such an exact picture in his mind. <laughs> so, there's a, a kind of pre-verbal symbol, and then there may be other, you know, others that we don't know about. And, you see, so that language is on top of all this, but then when we start to talk, we forget this, and these symbols now begin to, we don't recognize that they're still part of our thought, and they seem to be something else, right? Hmm. So this is what you were speaking about earlier in terms of bringing these things up into the verbal and understanding them? Yes, well, at least not getting a look at them, right? You see... Hmm? This is where I'm not quite clear, right. because I'm wondering, as you talk about this, it seems that it's true. Yeah. There, there's this whole underlying level of pictures going on. And but feelings, does that mean we're, Excuse me? And that feelings as well, you see, little feelings can represent... See, Einstein said that... See, Einstein didn't talk until quite a long... Uh, until he was fairly old. And uh, he, he said that his, a lot of his thought consists of feelings he can't describe, which obviously they're standing in, right? So you might imagine that the little child has sometimes represent things by feelings. Eh? You, right. see, you see. I, my question is, this seems to elicit a certain level of clarity when you start to bring these up and verbalize them. Yes. They may be missed otherwise. But is, is it the... Are we to be selective about this? Because it seems to be going on all the time. What I'm wondering is, can we constantly be bringing... No, we can't. No, I think we're just learning about it. You see, we're not trying to do anything. You see, this is right. crucial. <laughs> we're not trying to achieve an objective, you know. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we don't have a program or a goal that we could define. Right? We are learning, right? You see, I'm trying to say, here's something we didn't know about this process, right? Hmm? It may be relevant, it may not. It may turn out to be helpful in some context, you know, to the fact that we know it. Hmm? And then we may be able to observe some of it by bringing it up, you see, bringing it up into words and you might get a connection to some of the other stuff and you get a better feeling for how it's working. Hmm? See, because one of the troubles is that this thought process is going on and we don't know how it's working at all and when we don't know how it's working we very quickly regard it as something else, non-thought. So we're making a better map, sort of, yeah. of what we're doing. Yeah. Sense. Yes, you see, one of the key difficulties has always been, I said, that thought does something and then says it's not thought, right? And then it tries to, that's a problem, it tries to do something about it, while well, it keeps the, making the problem. Hmm. Because it doesn't know what it's doing, right? It's all a bunch of reflexes working. Remember, thought is the past, right? <laughs> past participle. It's been registered there, and, it, and it, that registration is through a set of reflexes. Hmm. Right? So that whenever, if this form appears which fits that whole set of uh, representations that would stand, you know, be brought up by the word table, if it fits in there, then you, so you get all the reflexes to the table right, right away, hmm? which makes it very useful. Hmm? But then you can make a mistake and you made the wrong movement and you're incoherent, then you've got to say, okay, it's wrong, I've got to go over it. Hmm? That, that's, I'm discussing how thought would properly work and does actually work in many areas. In order to show that, th first of all, to show that thought is not all bad, but secondly, to, to understand what has gone wrong, we should have some understanding of how it would work when it's right. Hmm? And is this the difference between thinking and thought, as well, you described earlier, the, the present in the context of a, a, work, uh, a workable thought versus... Well, when you're thinking, you're ready to see that when it doesn't work, and you're ready to start changing it, right? Now, thought sort of works automatically. Now, thought is always there, but the thinking is, it means that when the thing isn't working, something more is coming in, which is ready to look at the situation and change the thought if necessary. Hmm? So it's an element that's outside of thought. It's a bit beyond thought, let's put it, it's a bit, it's not purely the past, right? It's not purely a set of reflexes in the past. Hmm? Would it be thought energized at the moment and the other one passive in the past? Well, the past is active, that's the trouble, you see. <laughs> the past, it's not really the past, it's the effect of the past in the present. See, the, the present has left 
a trace in the past. Uh, the, the other way around, the past has left a trace in the present. Hmm? So the thinking would be even more energized. Yeah, the thinking will be more energized because the thinking is more in the present, right? But that present includes what thought, the incoherence that thought is actually doing, right? Hmm? You know, and it may include allowing new, new reflexes to form new arrangements, new ideas, you see. It, uh, if the reflexes are all sort of open and flexible and changeable, then that'll all work nicely. Hmm? So, hmm? so if I understand you clearly, by looking at these primal feelings and thoughts, images, we have a second opportunity to look at them again, more energized, with more... Yeah, we see them right there. And we are able to look at them with something beyond, we suppose, beyond the conditioning, right? right. It, it's not entirely conditioned how we look, right? You see, so therefore we say it's, it's more alive and so on. Hmm? So, and we say, uh, we're, we want, we're saying we're doing this because it's very important to come into real contact with this system, which really rules our lives. I mean, in addition, it's very necessary, and I've explained how all the good things it can do and how it works when it works properly and so on. Hmm? Can thought deceive us that it's thinking, but it's not really thinking? Oh, yes. It can, de it can deceive us about anything and anything and everything. You see, there's no limit to its power of deception. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> because you could say every trick we know, thought knows in the next moment, you see. <laughs> If we see a trick, then thought has it there in the next moment in the reflexes, right? <laughs> so thought is us, you see. So in other words, thought is not different from us, right? So we are the deceivers, and well, we are the deception. Yes. You see, so, you see, thought can you know, do all that deception. Now, but uh, I've discussed how thought works when it is not deceiving, you see. Now then, uh, and we say it gets into this... Uh, trouble which comes par for many reasons it's hard to analyze it one reason is that ultimately the, the chemistry is too rigid all these little these connections are too rigid or you could say there's the thought of absolute necessity which provides a hold on the whole thing but they all work together right hmm? How what How is absolute necessity? well you see there could be a, a, a view of absolute necessity which was just a perception saying at this moment, it's a, as far as we... Falling on my head, i got to move. Yeah, you've got to move, you see, and that's it. Now, but then, uh, you say it's absolutely necessary for me to do various things to achieve my ambition. And that may be the past, you see. It may be the, this whole system saying that. Huh? Uh, so, uh, uh, well, that, that, that's really, um, you see, so we have this situation then, right? That we have... That thought provides representations which we can produce outside or inside <laughs> and communicate, uh, uh, produce as symbols that we can communicate and also that hold everything together and connect everything. And the mass media? The mass media carry them all, you see. <laughs> they disseminate them. <laughs> uh, they act like seeds, that's a good word, disseminate, you see. that It scatters them, they all become seeds of further reflexes, right? So. The people who receive them, it become, they become new reflexes. Hmm. They take root and become new reflexes, right? Hmm. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, uh, and it's all a, a system, you see, and working. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and you, you can see that thought is inherently going to be incomplete, you see. It can at best provide a representation, an abstract representation. It will not contain the thing itself, right? <laughs> the thing itself is not only more than it could be contained in it, but it, it has, thought is not always right. It has parts in it which are wrong when extended. It's also, the thing itself is always in some way different from what we think it is, right? <laughs> it, you see, it is never exactly what we think, and uh, some of our thought is mistaken. You see, uh, when extended, you see, for example, people believed that Newton's laws would hold forever because they held for several hundred years. And yet, uh, you know, a new Einstein quantum theory and relativity came in and overturned them. And, uh, you know, that during the late 19th century, Lord Kelvin, one of the leading theoretical physicists, said it's no use to young people to go into theoretical physics, it's finished. 
mm -hmm. matter of the next refinements and the next decimal points. And you see, uh, uh, the thing didn't uh, it didn't work out that way. And now many people are talking, some physicists, of a theory of everything. They don't have it, but they say we're going to have it. We hope, and uh, the uh, we expect. And uh, but you see, it's the same thought is always trying to claim that it knows everything, right? Hmm. It has some tendency in it. We have to see why. You see, this is a very dangerous tendency which leads to self-deception. Right? It doesn't leave open that the unknown. You see, it doesn't leave open the thought is only a representation, and it must leave room in your thought for something more and something different. See, healthy thought requires that it intrinsically be built so that it has room always for something more and something different. Hmm? Saying whatever the representation is, it could be something more and something different. Or to put it differently, you could say that at most you could say, as far as I know, that is the way it is. Hmm? But that leaves room for something more and something different. Hmm? Now, that would be healthy thought, proper thought, or orderly thought would have to have that form and structure. And now, a great deal of our thought doesn't have that. Right? You see, for example, religious thought doesn't, often doesn't have it. Um, a lot of our political thought doesn't have it. You know, our, even a lot of our scientific thought, as I've just explained, doesn't have it. <coughs> And, uh, and so on, you see. So, uh, therefore, uh, that's a crucial point, that one of the ways thought goes wrong is it claims implicitly, at least, to be able to know everything, right? or to have, that it could get rid of uncertainty and get rid of the unknown, that it, it really, there's always this drive to say, we will eventually get hold of it all, right, in thought. Hmm? That has been, I don't know always, but there has been. And, uh, and that, seems as civilization develops, that drive seems to even get stronger. Uh, it gives a sense of security, doesn't it? You see, considering that thought is reflex, a lot of thought is aimed at increasing our security, right? Hmm? And, and in a very in a legitimate way, it provides for greater security. <laughs> I mean, we get food, you know, we store up food and uh, do various things. So, uh, uh, it begins then, to gradually extend and say, I not only need that kind of security, I need other kinds, I need emotional security, I need relational security, I need to know it and be sure of everything. You see, uh, and once it has security, it, it provides for the endorphins to coat the pain nerves and you feel well. And as soon as that's questioned, the endorphins are removed, the nerves get all excited, and there's a drive to think the thoughts that will give you security, saying that I know it, know it all, right? So uh, that's, that's part of the reflex system. Right? See, so therefore, can we stay with the fact that thought does not know at all, right? That thought, uh, there's always uncertainty, or at least as far as we can see, there's always uncertainty. There's always the unknown, right? Hmm? That our representations are adequate up to a point. For example, we could say this table you know, if you take a circular table, it looks like an ellipse from various angle directions. But we know that, uh, that, th that those are all different appearances of a single circular form. So we represent the table as a circle. Hmm? We say that's what it is, a solid circle. But then a, a scientist came along and said, well, that's mostly empty space. It's atoms moving around inside. And it's really quite different. It's only a, very roughly a circle. If it only uh, it's rather like a cloud might look like a circle, but <laughs> it's no circle, you see. So uh, then, uh, uh, so we could say the essence is now the atoms, and we say the appearance is now the, the circle is, according to these scientists, only an appearance. <coughs> but then they came along later and said these atoms. Originally, the word atom meant it couldn't be cut, and yet they said now it's made of electrons and protons and neutrons. And the, the uh, uh, and, and mostly empty space, and therefore the atom is only an appearance, and these other particles are the essence. And then, then came quarks, and then came other things. You see, so you could wonder if they're ever going to finish this, or whether it's not just that uh, it's always a representation, which may be adequate or not. It may be a correct representation up to a point, right? If it's correct, it will guide us coherently, hmm? to the extent that it is correct. Hmm? At some stage, since it's incomplete representation, it must cease to guide us coherently, and then we need to change our thought. So, 
we do not expect to find some eternal truth about the, the, about the nature of matter. Right? The nature of matter, as far as we can see, could be infinite and un unlimited, right? qualitatively as well as quantitatively. Right? In other words, we don't, there's, no reason, there's no valid reason why we should think of matter as limited. <laughs> see, people have been thinking in the 19th century it was limited in this way, and then they, now is the 20th. In the 21st or the 22nd, they may think entirely differently, and they'll look for a new the final theory, but which looks very different. Then it might go on and on. <laughs> but you see, we don't. Uh, it's important that there is no such. There's no justification for that. That it's not the right way to think. You see, to think that way is going to is going to mix up the thought process. So, <laughs> what? what you're saying. Well, is that knowing can never be absolute. Yeah. I've, 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 I've focused on matter where we have the most solid knowledge, right? right? With science, and that cannot be absolute. And if we go into society and into the psyche and so on, <laughs> it seems that's far less definite than the, than the scientific knowledge of matter, right? Hmm? So, uh, the, uh, uh, therefore, we're saying knowledge is limited, right? Knowledge may be adequate. Knowledge provides a representation. Uh, it is not the thing itself, whatever that may be. <laughs> it is not uh, that which is, right? We, we could just call it a view, there are many different views. Yeah, it's an appearance or a view, or we could, but it's, a, it's, not a, it's also a representation in the sense you can bring it up again and again. From, it's a reflex which gives rise to a, a view, right? Hmm? Right. We have to keep it open yeah. and not put it in a conclusion that close it. Yes, well, that's right. You see that, but then you have to admit that uh, there is that there's no that we're not going to get the whole of it. That there, that there's always the unknown is always open there. You see that, and uh, 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 the uh, and it must be that the unknown is you know, far beyond the known, right? Immensely beyond the known. Hmm? See, for example, uh, in physics, uh, you know, they now, well, oh, oh, we'll discuss that later, I think. You see, it would, uh, probably it would come more appropriately later. The, uh, uh, so, uh, n knowledge is limited, that's uh, the point. And, <coughs> Uh, uh, and, and the proper application of this system of knowledge requires that knowledge know that it is limited. <laughs> are, you, are you describing two ways of thinking? One that limits and solidifies and maybe practical in a certain way, and another way that is always open? Well, the way that's open is the most practical, you see, uh, because the way that's open includes relative solidification to any degree that may work, right? Hmm? We say, this table is relatively solid, I admit it, you see, but I don't say it's absolutely solid. You see, you could find a, an atomic structure in there, it's mostly empty space. If you light a fire, it turns into gas, you see, so the, the explanation is the atoms just simply are sort of held together by forces, and the, when the temperature goes up, they uh, sort of just come apart, right? <laughs> they go into space, you see, so... Therefore, you'd have to say that this table is not absolutely solid, right? The idea that the table is solid is a representation. Hmm? And I gave the example that it looks solid, you expect it to be solid, your reflexes are set for it to be solid. If this were a very good laser image, you would be ready to put a glass on it and it would go through, right? <laughs> you say so. And then you would say that, you know, that uh, that's the wrong representation, huh? What is it that allows us to see our conclusions in different areas of life where we're no longer learning, where we've come to an opinion? Yeah, well, opinions may be all right. They're assumptions. We may make assumptions, right, as long as we can, we know their assumptions. They could. But what allows us to see those opinions and those conclusions that we have? Yeah, well, about? I think the question is the other way around. Why don't we see them? You see, why do we think that they are true? Well, if we try to program it to learn about every aspect of ourselves, that too, it seems, would 
be just part of the system. Yeah, we, yeah we, you can't really program it, but I'm saying that there may be a, an unconditioned capacity or potential in, in us to look at this, right? And see what it is. That's what I'm suggesting. We, we, we leave that open. Right? Now, th I think it's essential for a healthy thought to leave that open, <coughs> because if you don't, then you'll imply that it's all conditioned, and therefore there's no way out. <coughs> we can never know, because we only think we know, because of the constant change. There are no absolutes. We never know absolutely. We always can know relatively, right? But it's a fairly good notion that this is a table that will support. I know that, right? But. Uh, I can't say anything, uh, the ultimate absolute about it, you know, wh what it will be like after this changes in time and so on. You see, uh, th that's relative knowledge, right? Relative to certain conditions and circumstances. But the notion that we know the whole thing or that we uh, have absolute knowledge, you know, will not work. Also, as you're saying, things change and the knowledge is limited to the past. And we extend our knowledge from the past toward the future. We, pro uh, we project it, right? And uh, very often that works. So we can take it, uh, uh, we take it saying as a provisional assumption that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. What we know is going to work, but we have to, the key thing is it's open. If it doesn't work, then we're ready to see it isn't working and change it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is to the point at this uh, part, but when I look at that table, there's a certain knowing of it as a table. But together with that, there is a feeling of it as a table. Yeah, you can feel it. You expect it to be solid and so on. No, but within me, together yeah. with the representation, yeah. comes a, a feeling of realness. Yeah, of reality. Right? And that feeling, it seems to me, is what makes that solid. In other words, and maybe we're going to do this later, but it's that feeling aspect of the table yeah. that locks the door. Yeah, but you see, the reflex of the re the representation is a set of reflexes all tied together, right? and it includes the feeling and the visual appearance and all that, right? So the, the, the word table ties all that together, right? It stands in for all of that. Hmm. You see, so now you get a sense that this is going to be solid, you see, which may be mistaken, it may be right. Hmm. Now, See, you get the fact that <clears throat> the mind starts to attribute various qualities to the table according to, you know, partly the way things have gone in the past and, uh, and partly by what is observed now. So, for example, uh, we've gone into this many times. If you have a television set and you see a telephone and it ring, and there's a ringing noise, then you, your mind attributes it to the telephone in the television image, it seems to be coming from there, right? Hmm? That's how you see it. Hmm? And yet, uh, if nobody answers the phone in the image, you again can say that it may be coming from the next room, and then you will hear, see it differently, right? So the, the sense of its being here inside the television set or in the next room comes from the way the thought is working. Hmm? See, so thought, uh, the set of reflexes can attribute and create that feeling that it is there as in the form that's attributed, right? Hmm? You see, that, that's all part of the process. And, uh, yeah, it may make some sense to make some difference between um, <coughs> knowledge in the past sense and knowing. But knowing requires being open and uh, seeing what's happening now, right? You said about Einstein, for example, that he was knowing things with his body yeah. in a different way. So it isn't just a series of images coming by in some program sequence. It can be a, an extension of being present, which is a form of knowing, not just a series of ideas floating by an observer. Yeah, well, I think that you see, you could say that as you get a feeling contact with the table, right? So Einstein got a feeling contact with the scientific ideas which he was working with, hmm? which was part of his thought. Hmm? Provided a different kind of barometer yeah, for yeah, the yeah, A richer sort of barometer, yeah. yeah. But the uh, thought related to death. Well, that <coughs> yes, we, we could, uh, but perhaps we should discuss it later, but uh, the... Uh, um, 
<laughs> See, it's very hard to get any uh, real contact with that because you have nothing to uh, connect it with, right? <laughs> So, uh, therefore, it's very hard to get it straight. You see, perhaps we'll try to bring it up later. Uh -huh. So, anyway, uh, uh, you have all this representation, and which includes all of that, including the feeling contact and the visual uh, sense and the uh, sound and the word and everything else. And so, uh, the, all the different meanings, and then. Now, what you see, there's a nice example. See, suppose you see a rainbow. Now, it seems to be an object out there, so colored arcs, right? <laughs> That's the way you experience it. Right? But according to phys physics, what, there's no rainbow out there. In fact, if you tried to walk, assume it was an object and walk toward it, it would not be found when you got there, right? <laughs> so, in fact, physics says that. The ground of the rainbow is really, there's a bunch of raindrops falling and there's light refracting off and it reaches your eye in a certain way. Everybody, it reaches everybody's eye in a rather similar way, so everybody agrees there's a rainbow. <laughs> but it doesn't mean there's a rainbow, right? <laughs> uh, you see, the, the, what actually is there, or at least closer to what is actually there, is falling rain and light refracting. Huh? A process. Huh? Isn't it this is true for the table? Well, the difference is that if you walk toward the table and you will touch it coherently, if you walk toward the rainbow, you will not. So, the rainbow is not a coherent object, right? It, it's an image having no... Um, all, it's like the laser image of the ship, you see. It doesn't have the whole being that the ship has. So, the rainbow does not have being as a bow. It has being as a, falling, a process of falling rain and light refracting. So the romantic aspect is, is dissolved. What? The romantic aspect, the poetic about the, the rainbow. Well, uh, physics, physics <laughs> dissolves that. Yes, but uh, you see, uh, uh, but the, the, the point is that, that that example is very interesting because um, it shows the way the thing works. You see that the, the rainbow is a representation. It's not produced, it would probably be produced in people even before words, but. You don't have to have words to have representations, you see, so as we've just gone into. So, the rainbow is a representation which, however, it does not cohere with what it, it's supposed to represent, you see. There seems to be a correspondence, though, because if you look at the table through a very powerful microscope, and yeah. you, in a sense, get closer and closer to the table, just like you get closer and closer to the rainbow, well, you never get closer to the rainbow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you see, it will move. It's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> There might be an analogy there. <laughs> well, so there might be some use in pushing that, though, because the table is so real to me in my yeah. feeling. But actually, even if I go up and knock on it or put a cup on it, <clears throat> Finally, all that I have is some sort of sensations, and the tableness of it is only in the stepping back and holding something in my mind. Yeah, the tableness is built from your mind, you see, right out of a whole set of reflexes, all tied together. Right? Now, the same is true of everything, but, see, so you could say that from that point of view, uh, science has said uh, things come into the nervous system, and, but in the brain they are... Uh, built somehow into this sense of the reality of the world, right? And now the point is, does this reality cohere in our experience, right? If the reality that is so formed does not cohere, then we have to change it, right? Hmm? But if you say that it's a kind of representation of reality, but uh, uh, that the brain is forming a representation which is able to guide you properly, you see, but that sense of the reality of objects and things is constructed. It's clear that uh, the, uh, uh, and in fact, psychologists like Piaget claim that uh, very young children may not have the notion of the reality of a permanent object. Or they may feel that it sort of com just vanishes and <laughs> something else comes up. And that, or as the unity of all the objects, you see. For example, he cites the case of some child of a couple of years old who thought that the father who appeared at the dinner table was different from the father in the office. <laughs> there were two people. <laughs> he, he later learned they're one. You see, so that's part of the thing. You see, the one and the many, you see, it's another abstract concept. That 
you have to get straight, right, in, in forming the representations. You see, your representation puts certain things as one, certain things as many, certain things as necessary, contingent, general, particular. You see, it, it all organizes it. Right? And the meaning is very different according to how it's put, you see. So that child was seeing two fathers, uh, and then he learned there was only one. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, therefore he saw one, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, and that, that was more coherent. Perhaps he discovered the incoherence in seeing two, you see. Uh, so, uh, th therefore, we have to say that representations can be correct up to a point. You see, appearances can be correct up to a point or not, or they may be illusory. Hmm? That distinction is very important. Hmm? The fact that we, it, that the brain constructs appearances is not the whole story. Huh? But the fact that certain, some of them are correct is crucial. That they're correct up to a point. Yeah, so... Yeah. Would you say then that the world that we see is just a description? No, the description is writing it down literally. It means, you know, the way we put it in words. The, wor the world we see is far more than those words, but it is, ha it is organized through a representation into which those words have had a big effect, right? Hmm? See, for example, see, the way we talk about things, the way we think about things affects how we see them. Whether we see two or one <laughs> is a crucial point, for example, right? <laughs> Uh, if you have printed words which are a bit too far away to be seen, if somebody tells you what the words are, you actually see them, right? There are many examples of that kind. You see so how the word affects what you see. So, uh, the thought, right? So, this is the point I want to make, that thought is affecting what you see. In other words, the representation enters into the perception. Sometimes you know it's a representation, like when you draw a diagram, right? Hmm? Or have a picture. But then the representation enters directly into the perception, and you may miss the fact that it is coming from thought. Like the representation of an enemy goes into the perception of that person as the enemy, you know, or as stupid, or as whatever, right? Hmm? Idiot, I see. Can you uh, tell the kaleidoscope from the magnifying glass? What's that? Well, I mean that thought is a mediation system to be aware of things that are not now or not present. Yes, but it's projected into what is now and present, and that projection may be a good guide. You see, it may be an accurate... Pro approximate. Way. Approximate, good enough, right? In other words, it's important to actually project it in to serve as, to be useful in what you're doing you because... another way to be <coughs> present to what's not now and not present? Well, maybe, but you see, this is, it's important to have this, that, to see this table as a table, and not to say this is just a representation. You see, when you were going to act toward it, you have to sort of act toward it as something that is present, right? So, but a lot of it is projected into what is present, but you act toward that too, right? The only point being that if it's not coherent, you change it. Hmm? You see, so therefore, it's crucial to have this, that the perception does affect, that the representation affects the perception. That's crucial. Hmm? Right. But it's also a source of illusion, if we don't once lose track of the fact that that is happening. Doesn't anything have multiple representations? Well, many things have, yes. There's anything that doesn't. Well, I shouldn't think so. You see, you could represent things in many, many ways, yeah. The Maybe thought is unlimited. To a particular representation? Oh, yeah, yeah. Rather than the representation yielding some deeper sense of significance, which would have more utility than the lock on the particular representation? Yeah, well, we get locked on a particular one because it may include reflexes that uh, give rise to good chemical states of the endorphins or something, you see. <laughs> or other reasons, uh, the, uh, the, the lock of absolute necessity, or... You see, there are various factors which can lock this thing so that you can't work this, let it change in the way that's called for when you see incoherent, when there's incoherence. Huh? And, you see, that, that's the way that illusion and mistakes arise, you see, and so on. Huh? 
and mistakes that you don't correct. Did you say thought is unlimited? <coughs> no. Well, thought is, is limited in what it can grasp. Each thought is limited, but there's no limit to how far you could extend thought, saying that now we can grasp this, tomorrow we could grasp more, we could go on indefinitely. But thought <coughs> does not grasp the whole, right? It's quite crucial that we check those representations then. What? It's quite crucial that we check those representations. Well, we have, yeah. You see, what's missing is we have to be able to see that thought is actually participating in perception. You see, one of the assumptions thought has become, comes to make is that certain kinds of thought don't participate, they only tell you the way things are, or perhaps they represent the way things are, right? So, but, and, and the, the, now the point is that thought actually participates not only in the fact that we made the world according to thought, our social world and so on, but also because it participates in the world that we see, right? Either correctly or incorrectly. Hmm? And now, not, but thought does not seem to know that it is doing this. And therefore, that's a crucial mistake, you see. Is that clear that that mistake can be very dangerous? Uh, my, ex my experience of my representation is my experience of reality. Yes. Yeah, the experience of reality includes the projection of representations into what you see, right? It's not entirely that because you have to take into account if it doesn't, if your mind is working right and it's, and the, represent and the whole thing is incoherent, then it loses its hold and you begin to change. Hmm? Is that clear? So it's, it's vital that we see the whole thing even beyond the personal. Yeah. If you look at the media, for example, they can make it go to war. And we well, the know. media are full of representations which are presented as, uh, you know, as perceptions, right? Hmm? right? In fact, now they have even docudramas, you see. They're doing it directly, you see. They, they put something in the form of a documentary, which is only a drama, you see. Could you give an example of a case where representation affects experience and we can see that easily? Well, they're great. Now you see, uh, there are a lot of examples in the sense that a, if you represent somebody as nasty and unpleasant, you see, very often cartoonists represent certain people as nasty and unpleasant. Let's say the Nazis would represent the Jews in a certain way in their cartoons, and then soon people were seeing them that way, right? But I mean, more like from our everyday experience where we could see how it works. I mean, is there anything in our sort of tangible experience where, where we actually see how the... Well, you see, this is what we're trying to get to. You know, this, this is a very subtle question. To actually see this thing happening is something <laughs> the human race doesn't do, you see. But it, I, I, I just thought it would be easier if we could, if there would be a, a, even a single example. And maybe there is not. Well, there are a lot of examples of how representation affects perception. I gave you the example, there are hundreds of examples of that time where if you have the letter indistinct and you state what it is, you see it that way. That, yeah, that's and, and also, very, when there are ambiguous figures, and then you say it's this way, you see it that way, you see. Mm -hmm. mm. When the figure is unambiguous, then uh, you can't easily see it, right? Mm. Mm. But in an ambiguous situation, it becomes clear that the way you're thinking is affecting the way you see. Mm. And are you suggesting that we may think that that's an anomaly, an exception, but you are suggesting, no, that's the general case? Yeah. I'm saying that that's the way perception works. We, we should, yes, let's try to have a break very soon, but uh, uh, sum it up here that it's how perception works, that it is highly affected by thought, right? And by representation and by imagination and so on. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you'll see that that's quite inevitable now. Uh, but we do not seem to see this happening. See, I, I could say that there are people who say that in very early times, people had a more participatory kind of thought. They would think that they were participating in some of the things they saw, right? Uh, like saying they participated in the totem of the tribe or in nature, in the whole nature. And they, uh, the Eskimos apparently had a belief that they could, that there was this, there were many, many seals, but they were all manifestations of the one seal, the spirit of the seal, we could say. That is, the, the one seal was manifesting. 
so they could pray to the spirit of the seal to manifest so they could have something to eat. Right. Now, if you thought all seals were individuals, that prayer would be ridiculous <laughs> because you're asking this seal to come up and just be eaten. You see this individual seal. But to the spirit of the seal, well, of course, I'll just manifest and I'm still here. <laughs> And you see, I think they looked at the buffalo that way and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, uh, uh, therefore, they felt they were participating in that. And in some way, they were more keenly aware of the participation of their thought. But in another way, they were perhaps overdoing it in the sense they were supposing the, the reality of some of the things which were being projected by the thought, right? In a way that may not have been right entirely. And then, we, to, we developed instead a more objective kind of thought, which said we, we want to have a thought about something where we don't participate, where we just think about it and know just what it is, right? Hmm? Is that right? And that made possible science and things like that, technology. Uh, now, uh, but that went too far because we began to apply that objective thought universally and said it applies inside, outside to everything. And, and we say there's no participation whatsoever by thought, right? Now, that's wrong, because clearly that, now, I've pointed out a great deal of participation in how it creates the world, and now we're saying also it clearly participates in perception, and that is the crucial form of participation. So, you see, thought participates in everything, but our ideal of objective thought is absolute non-participation, right? just simply telling you the way things are and doing nothing whatsoever, hmm? right? Now, in some areas, that's a good approximation. Hmm? But we have supposed that to be the universal situation. Hmm? Our thought has. Hmm? Is that? So, we could say now that here is one of the questions that thought, where thought is going wrong. This could be said to be a part of, very close to the fundamental flaw in the process, namely that thought is doing this thing and doesn't realize it's doing it. Hmm? Is that clear what the question is? This may sound very simplistic, but we say that thought can only function by dividing. Well, and yeah. Once it's divided, that can't be the whole. But well, yes, but but also thought can't be the whole because it's just a representation and abstraction, right? Hmm. And thought may divide in the sense of distinguish, uh, may, uh, no, marking apart, or it may divide in the sense of separating. Right? And tacitly, thought has made a separation rather than a mark, right? See, we ought to just make a, a dotted line between thought and perception, right? But thought has made a solid line and says thought is one side, perception is on the other. And that line <coughs> has this physiological component and so the line is experienced as real. Yes, the, the separation is experienced as real, the division. Because whatever thought, rep that's the representation of thought, that becomes the perception of the situation, right? You're saying that thought, by setting boundaries, is creating the separation all the time. It's creating the sense of separation, and then the action flowing from that creates, uh, breaks things up, right? Uh, is that clear? That we'll have to discuss this some more, but See, th this is really getting close to the crucial difficulty with thought, that it does not keep track of what it's doing, right? That, that, that has been the difficulty all along. So the representation of thought. Now, thought is making a representation and present it as a perception? Yes. But that's a deception. No. It's not necessarily one, because it may be necessary for practical purposes to see this table as a table. If you're approaching and driving a car, you haven't time to go through all those thoughts. You must directly move toward the, what you see, which includes a lot of thought, right? right? Hmm? The meaning of what you see is included in how you see it, right? Hmm? Is that clear? So it is a necessary feature of the whole system, and yet, if thought knew it was doing this, then it would be all right. The deception consists in the fact that thought doesn't know it's doing it. It seems that I'm doing it, but thought is doing it. Yeah, thought is doing it. Or it doesn't even know it's happening. You see, it says that's perception, I'm thought. Right? 
I'm just telling you the way things are. I see what way things are, and uh, I just tell you. Okay, separation. What? Separation between me and what's happening. Yeah, I'm that's right. The do... separation which is false because the way I think is affecting what I see. So that perception, that perception, the thought that the me is one and there is no separation. Well, I don't think we've got to the me yet. We're tr just trying to say there's a mistake in thought even before we raise the question of me, right? Hmm. Now that mistake in thought will allow this false notion of the me to develop. <coughs> yes, I think we should break now. Fifteen minutes at most, right? Very exact. <laughs> yeah, so we were talking now about the thought affecting perception, you know, and not knowing it does so. This, and this may make a crucial mistake because we may take the, thought, the way thought enters perception as a fact and we think more on the basis of that so-called fact. Right? <laughs> we can get into a trap. Hmm? Like we may say, uh, you know, people of that kind are no good. I can see they're no good, right? <laughs> you know, and so on and so on. <laughs> and the... Uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, that requires some attention, this, uh, see this question of thought entering perception. Now, it will not only do so outwardly, but also inwardly, and we'll have to see the serious consequences of that. When we try to imagine perceiving ourselves, <laughs> and distinguish, you know, disentangling that from our thoughts about ourselves. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, okay, now is that, uh, maybe you want to ask one or two more questions? And I'm a little confused about something, but I, I have a feeling it's certainly not what I've heard. Uh, no. You talked earlier, the last session, about how, how deceptive thought can be, very deceptive. <coughs> And then you also talked at the end of the last session about uh, how unaware thought can be. Somehow or other, on one hand, I get the feeling of a very coy and conniving... Oh, I see your point. Okay, point so I'm a little confused. Uh, well, I wouldn't say thought is... In a way, thought is very cunning, but it's not really very aware of what it's doing. And uh, the same cunning also is what solves practical problems. <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, uh, if we think of it as a set of reflexes which has a tremendous uh, adaptability and it can find all sorts of ways of making you feel better, for example. Mm. It, it feels around, it, it, you know, it probes, it, uh, it, it finds ways which may look extremely ingenious. When <laughs> but in fact, it doesn't mean that it has been really a vicious spirit there trying to do you wrong, you know, do you in or something. Uh, <clears throat> There is a kind of wishful thinking which supports the weakness of the memory, and the forgetfulness of certain details, is what actually happens. Yeah, but I meant that's part of, the deception may include the fact that thought uh, makes you forget, you see. Thought is able to make you insensitive to, you see, it can, uh, all the reflexes which might make you sleepy or not inattentive or forgetful, or thought can take command of them and operate them, right? <laughs> it can change. See, for example, I suppose one view is you can be a bit on uh, serotonin and make you too too much. This chemical called serotonin could make you somewhat too uh, a bit dopey, I suppose. So thought might find a way to liberate serotonin, right? By certain thoughts could find a way. Of, you know, thought can sort of probe around. So it's one system, all of it. That's the crucial point. That it's all thought is all one, and all those movements are all one system, but the system even en enters perception, right? and the uh, it affects perception. So, uh, uh, that thought could make you feel sleepy, thought could make you feel very excited, or, you know, thought could make the mind dart, so it won't stay with the point, right, saying, quick, something else is important, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, it can do all sorts of tricks to try to keep your mind off a point that might, that thought supposes might be disturbing. In the end, you think it's just doing it for to help you, though? It's not really doing it 
any for any other reason but, but it's doing to help it, the system yes it's doing what it's supposed to do to try to help but it's very con it's, yeah, it's yeah. extremely confused about what it's doing so it does harm right, right. Mm. But it doesn't seem that, that thought has the whole system's well-being uh, as its aim or goal it seems that it's uh, much more a particular pleasure or sensation yeah but that's the way thought conceives the the key feature of the whole system right? saying getting that pleasure or pain you see originally thought was set up to try to protect you and help you and after a while it runs on its own and it's just running right? I don't think you should think it's trying to do anything it's just uh, uh, any more that your knee jerk is trying to do anything is I'm not quite clear about that because that, to, to put a, a moral judgment to say it's wrong I think that's different but we can see that in many cases at least thought is trying to uh, achieve a certain objective <coughs> Yes, uh, which it has. Its pleasure, satisfaction, whatever that is. Well, I don't know that that's the way you interpret it, but it may not be doing that. You see, uh, let's try to think that suppose that uh, suddenly the endorphins have been removed from the pain nerves and the brain is objecting very strongly and thought really reacts, uh, responds, you know, with, with reflexes aimed at uh, doing whatever will release that, right? Will reduce that. Hmm? Right. Which is what it does all the time anyway. So it's more of a mechanical view than we would like to admit. Yeah, I'm trying to say these reflexes are relatively mechanical, and say though the system as a whole, so though the brain as a whole is not mechanical, it can get caught into a system of reflexes that looks like a machine. Isn't it also a certain what? demand for security? The brain demands security. Yes, that's right, but you see, faced with some sort of disturbance, the brain gets agitated and thought process comes in with reflexes to try to diminish the agitation. Huh? So uh, uh, there's nothing special about it, it just goes on, you see. Now, as if it were a machine, though it is not a machine. See, after the fact, we call it these things. We say that it is trying to do something or that it's mechanical, but that's only a description after the fact. And in yeah. the fact, it's not merely what is going on. Yeah. It, it, in effect, it, its behavior can be represented as mechanical, but only up to a point, right? Hmm? <coughs> oh, I don't know which is first. <laughs> I would like to know if you could clarify for me or what, what would you understand by psychic energy and thought and the connection between both of them? Well, it's hard at this point to do that. I mean, uh, see, thought will it will liberate through the reflexes all sorts of energies, right? So thought is in command, as it were, of a whole range of energies, hmm. Hmm. which in turn affect thought. Right? Hmm. Now, at a certain level, uh, these energies are not the most subtle energies, you know, of the unconditioned. <laughs> but there are a great range of energies there. Hmm. But you. Is, uh, isn't, isn't thought primarily dominated by conditioning for the, uh, say, 95, 99 percent of it? But we do have a small percentage there where we have the opportunity to uh, s see things differently, and then the new conditioning comes out out of that when there is a change. Yes, that's is that right. approximately right. Uh, that's right. Yes, that the thought has. If you think that the thought works by conditioning, it has to get conditioned. You see, you need conditioning, right, to learn a language, to learn how to write, or to do all sorts of things. And then when it gets too rigid, it won't change when it should change, right? Hmm? Uh, but there may be some areas where it's not that rigid, it could change, and then there it can make new, uh, you can get something new, hmm? a new set of reflexes. But there's a window of opportunity occasionally in which uh, yeah. uh, we see something, that's the reason we occasionally get an insight to a change. Or That's right, yeah. There, there, this window may arise in all sorts of fortuitous ways, or perhaps non-fortuitous, but uh, see, what we're doing now is, pr I hope, creating some kind of window, right? In other words, is perhaps the, uh, the uh, unconditioned energy is awakening or something, and therefore it can begin to look at this conditioning, you see. For whatever it's worth, I, I believe I had read somewhere that thought is it frames, uh, still frames, uh, 
something like 10 to 15 frames per second for whatever it's worth. Well, uh, is that, does that have any validity? I don't know. You see, uh, uh, I mean, that may be somebody's theory. I, I don't know much about it. See, uh, it could be a, a pro you know, I, uh, it doesn't sound quite right. Can we say that thought is a peacemaker between the brain demand and the senses demand, and it gives to both? It's trying to, but it, in fact it stirs it up, you see, because it's not doing it intelligently. But you th it, it thinks it's doing it. Yeah, that. that's right. Now you had a question back then. Yeah, when, when um, there's the agitation of the disappearance of the endorphins, the agitation of the brain to, to get that state back, what, what are the other um, possibilities? I didn't get that. Well, you say that when you don't have a feeling of well-being or the endorphins aren't there anymore, the brain becomes agitated and searches for a way to... Then thought, thought begins to try to solve that, you see. Now, so what are the other options aside from thought solving it? Well, you see, if thought didn't do anything, it might be there was another solution would come. Uh, the, the agitation might just disappear, you see. It may be that, you know, stay with the fact that there are no endorphins for a little while and soon it'll come to a new equilibrium, right? <laughs> uh, you see, there may be no real problem at all except that thought says, quick, I must do something. Mm. It's condition, yeah. <coughs> so it's different from the same time. The what? And we go to this tomorrow. Yeah, 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 we're going to. We're going to that tomorrow, yeah. Uh, right, well now, there were a few points then. Uh, you see, so we have this, let me say a few more points then, that we have this um, question that thought af affects perception, right? And this, this will be very crucial for the thought and the thinker tomorrow, uh, because the question arises, you know, how are we going to, uh, or the observer and the observed or whatever, how are we going, if thought affects what we perceive, how are we going to separate the two? <laughs> and, and, and so on. Now, uh, the... Uh, now, but there is one point I would like to bring up now, which is related to that, which is, would it be possible for thought... See, I, I'm going to say thought is a movement, you see. Every reflex is a movement, really. You see, is that clear? It, it, it moves from one thing to another. It may move the body or the chemistry or just simply the, the image or something. So when A happens, then B follows. It's a movement. Hmm? Uh, now, uh, so all these reflexes are all interconnected in one system, and the suggestion is that they're not really all that different. One thought is more subtle, the intellectual part, hmm? but they are really basically similar in structure. Hmm? Hmm? So, therefore, uh, uh, we should think of thought as a part of the bodily movement, at least explore that possibility. Hmm? And because our culture has led us to believe that thought and bodily movement are really two totally different spheres, hmm? and not connected, you know, basically. And uh, maybe they are not, you see. Now, uh, the, uh, the evidence is that they are not, hmm? that thought is intimately connected with the whole system. Hmm? And the... Uh, uh, now, we have in the body a very interesting situation called proprioception, means self-perception. You see, if you move your, any part of your body, you know that you have moved it, it resulted from your intention. You know that immediately, without time, without an observer, you know, without having to think, right? Hmm? Uh, that, if you don't know, if you can't tell that, then you're in a very bad way, you see. Uh, uh, the. Uh, you, there are people who have lost it and they don't know, can't move, you see, and they, uh, but uh, the, uh, because you must be able to distinguish between a movement that you have created and one that occurred independently. Now, the, uh, the, I've often cited this case of a woman who uh, woke up in the middle of the night and when the light was turned on, you know, she was found to be hitting herself when she stopped, but what happened was she'd had a stroke which damaged her sensory nerves, which would tell her what she was doing, but not the motor nerves, so she could still do it. So she may have touched herself, but since she wasn't being informed that that was her, 
therefore it was assumed right away it was something else, an attack, right? Then the more she defended, the worse the attack got, right? So, and then when the light was turned on, the proprioception was reestablished. She could then see with her eye what she was doing, right? Hmm? So the, uh, uh, now, uh, there is also the case which was published of a, a woman who somehow lost proprioception overnight and she couldn't move her body and she had to be watching every mo movement and learned to, very skillfully to watch and somehow to get along. <laughs> and that never changed apparently, but uh, everyone knows what happened, some damage somewhere. But the, uh, uh, so, uh, now th this quality of proprioception, you see, it is there for the body, right? Mm. And it, one of the things is to see the relation between the intention to move and the movement, right? To see immediately that relation, right? Mm. To be aware of it. Right? Uh, and you see, this intention to move, we're usually not very aware of it, but we can be. You see, if somebody wants to make his movements more accurate, he'll find his intention is not that well defined. He doesn't move the way he hopes, right? <laughs> He has to learn, his, somebody who wants to be, play the piano has to learn that relation better, right? <laughs> so his fingers will do what he wants to do. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, now, so the, the, a, a greater quality of proprioception occurs in that regard, right? Hmm? Now, the, uh, 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 and, and this intention, see, the essence of the movement may be in the intention to move, you see, the, uh, that it unfolds into the whole movement, right? Mm. Uh, so like, for example, the, we knew of this man who was, had a degenerative disease and was unable to move at all, he could barely talk, and yet he taught movement in a university. <laughs> so the question is, how could he do it? And you could guess that somehow, being very intelligent and unable to move, he was much more aware of the intention than we are, right? Because we focus our energy, our attention on the result. <laughs> so, see, getting the intention right may be very crucial to make the movement right. <laughs> see, so, uh, anyway, uh, there is some relation between the intention to move and the movement and something in between which you're vaguely aware of. Right? And the, uh, uh, and that is proprioception. Now then, but if we say thought is a reflex, you know, like any other muscular reflex, but just a lot more subtle and more complex and changeable or something, then we ought to be able to uh, be proprioceptive with thought, right? Thought should be able to be, uh, perceive its own movement, hmm? or be aware of its own movement. Hmm? Uh, in the process of thought, there should be awareness of that movement, so that if there's the intention to think, and if that thinking produces a result, which is, we, we can be aware of how it produces a result outside by being more attentive, and then maybe we could even be aware of how it affects perception, right? <laughs> you see, by that, immediately. You see, it has to be immediate or else it will, we will never get it clear, right? Hmm? If there's any time in there, then, you see, if, if you took time to be aware of this, then you would never be able to move, right? Hmm? You know, so the, um, uh, is, there, is that proprioception possible? I'm raising that question. Is it clear what the question means? Well, when you say, <coughs> and be aware, is that the proper way to say it? Or would you say, there was an aware, there may be an awareness, and after the fact, some thought may be made about it. Well, let, let's say, what, can the movement of the body be aware of its own, of itself proprioceptively? You could ask that question, right? The movement of the body includes all that goes with it. Hmm? I mean, any the awareness and everything. Hmm? See, um, uh, and a movement without awareness is quite different from a movement with. Hmm? So, could we say, can the movement of thought be aware of itself? Can you distinguish that from self-consciousness? Because I'm confused. Yeah, because when you move the body and are aware of it, you're not self-conscious. You see, if you were, you wouldn't be. It wouldn't work. See, it's a, you may be very busy thinking about something else, and you're aware that you have moved this, right? Hmm? Is that clear what I mean? You know, you directly take that into account, whatever you're doing, that I have produced that movement, and you act accordingly. Hmm? Is that... But like 
going down the steps, you don't think like you. Yeah, when you, you don't. stop to think, you may trip. <laughs> yeah, that's that would be more or less it. If you walking down the steps, well, suppose you're walking down the steps and or wherever you're walking, and and you push on something and it moves, you see, and you moved it, but that's different from saying it suddenly moved by itself. Huh? Mm -hmm. Now you're aware of that, you don't have to be thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that sort of awareness is necessary for you to be able to walk properly. So that, that whole movement is somehow aware of the relation between the intention and the result because it can say that is a result of my my intention to move, and this is not. This is, came from somewhere else. Hmm? But it doesn't put that in words or go through a complicated analysis or anything. It's somehow directly aware. Hmm? And, and then, then all the reflexes can behave accordingly. Hmm? Is, is that clear? Yeah. See, now suppose thought could do that. I, I've given arguments saying, why shouldn't it do it if thought is a, just an extension of all those body reflexes? Uh, that. Uh, 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 maybe thought could do it, and then thought could be aware of what it's doing, you see, which is the basic trouble with thought, that it, it participates and is not aware of how it is participating. i got to go back to the physical. Yeah. I can get it, because then I can't go on. I don't know what this woman meant by self-conscious, but well, yeah. um, I, I wouldn't put the self into it, but I actually have to be with that movement at that moment. Or, or with a sensation. Yeah, but you're not aware of <coughs> yourself thinking and being separate from the oh, movement. Okay. <coughs> oh, okay. Now you see, when you say I begin thinking about myself, you begin to yeah, okay. get into that sort of thing. Now, therefore, uh, uh, now I'm saying, uh, see, if thought tried to look at itself in the usual way, separate itself from itself, yeah. then it couldn't do it. You see, but suppose thought, without separating itself in any way would just be aware that it is moving. <laughs> and you see, and various things are happening, including things happening outside and things happening inside, not only feelings and things like that, but also perceptions are being affected and so on. Hmm. That this change of perception came through thought, I immediately see that. That change of perception came because the object actually changed. <laughs> it's important. Because I may say, you suddenly became angry at me. I perceive that. That may be what happened because of what you did, but maybe I suddenly thought of something which made me see you as angry, right? Hmm? Like saying, somebody says, that's paranoia, you see. The boss, I'm thinking, the boss is walking along with, the, have an, have an into, nondescript look on his face, right? And I'm saying, maybe he's unhappy and frowning, and maybe he's thinking he's going to fire me, right? <laughs> So I see him as the one who is ready to fire me, right? So that, that came from my perception being affected by thought, right? Hmm. On the other hand, maybe that's what's actually happening. <laughs> the distinction is very important, right? But you may help to make it happen by seeing it wrongly, right? because you will behave in a way which will induce him to want to do it, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> see, so you see that Getting, see, paranoia is a case where people don't get that straight at all, right? Hmm. Now, we are usually able to get some of those questions straight, saying, okay, that's just my imagination, right? <laughs> but very often we don't. Hmm. Now, then paranoia is a case where it gets much harder, you know? Hmm. So, uh, uh, therefore, proprioception has failed still more. Hmm? You see, you can't tell the difference between what he's doing, what, what he's done, and what uh, has happened independently. He sees threats everywhere, which may be his own thoughts. Hmm? Can you please talk about, tell us a little bit about paranoia? I don't know much about it. I'm just saying <laughs> it's just simply that people see uh, projecting their fears and so on into, into their perceptions all the time, right? And people are doing it anyway, but paranoia it gets exaggerated, right, and beyond what people usually do. Hmm? So, uh, and they become unable to function. I suppose when something happens, like a boss is walking down the hall and the fellow has a particular expression on his face, that may be just a perceptual fact, but hmm. any kind of interpretation on that has to be questioned. Yes, but the difficulty is that you don't see it, as an especially if you're paranoid, you don't right. see it as interpretation. You see 
the thought that you had, the interpretation that you had, which is a representation of a boss who is ready to fire you, becomes the perception of a boss who is ready to fire you. Right? Right, I'm not even talking about the paranoia, because I think we all... No, well, we all do it, but to doing... different degrees. Right. Right? You see, that's merely, paranoia is merely exaggeration of the usual behavior. Right? Is it kind of leprosy in thought? <laughs> well, it, it goes too, too far, you know. About yeah, the muscles, as if it was some proprios a problem in proprioception. Well, it is in a way. The, the, the muscles, the, the the nerves which would tell the muscles what they are doing have been damaged, and you don't feel the pain you should feel when you overexert, and therefore you pull the whole the nose out of joint, you pull everything out of joint, and destroy. So, you pull your fingers off. <laughs> so carrying that back to start have a problem was like leprosy. Yeah, well, it's a similar problem in a sense that. That is a problem of lack of bodily, at the bodily level, lack of proprioception of the force of the muscles, right? And you're not being informed properly of the force you're using. And then when you see the, the limbs coming off, the fingers coming off, you say, my God, the fingers are coming off by themselves, you see. <laughs> but you're actually uh, pulling them off without noticing. <laughs> does the paranoia have qualities like that? A force well, it that's probably does, driving. because it would produce reactions that would... You see, if, if somebody treats somebody as an enemy, or as a, a threat, and then it will become visible, and he may become frightened and <laughs> respond, right? Hmm. Are all representations within the system? All representations? Yes, the system produces representations. There wouldn't be a form of representation um, of another dimension? Well, there might be, but I'm saying, I don't know. You see, insofar as they're based on the past, they're in the system, right? Hmm? Now, can I ask? Yeah. The way we function now, the brain is not proprioceptive, right? Well, it is in many ways, but not in this way. <clears throat> not in the thought. Not in thought. No, there's no proprioception in the thought process. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you're suggesting that it may be possible to function in a mode but it acts as if there were proprioception. Or in fact, where well, there would be proprioception. There would be proprioception. Yeah. I'm saying I don't see, from the argument I've given, I don't see why I should distinguish what goes on in the brain from what goes on anywhere in the body, or what goes on in thought from what goes on with the muscles, or with the any, anything, right? That they're all similar, basically similar, though different in many ways, right? Hmm. So now, it's too <coughs> elementary, but uh, the lack of proprioception, as we now know it, means that I cannot distinguish whether an image is based on that which is going on or yeah. what I think is going on. Yes, that's right. Okay. You see, we should be able to say, I see what is going on, I have formed inferences, I distinguish my inferences from what I see, and I and check my inferences against what I see later. Hmm. But, I, but my seeing is not confused with the inferences. <laughs> now that would be clear thinking, right? Common sense clear thinking. But now that becomes, that's stopped, that's blocked by the fact that some of the things I see are actually been projected into there by my thought, hmm? or by representations. And then, when I start thinking about them, I'm thinking about them wrongly. Uh, you see, there are conclusions, as uh, they say in the court, they're conclusions and not facts, right? <laughs> but they look like facts. And sometimes they are terrifying, so... Yeah. So it would seem that usually we think that, that what we perceive is terrifying, but it may be actually that the way we perceive is terrifying. Yes, well, we are projecting terrible things. You see, when you're dreaming, you may project terrible things into the dream, right? It's the same sort of thing. That there, you, what you perceive may be entirely due to thought, right? But it looks, it, it's quite convincing as a perception, right? Well, I mean, that, that if we had proprioception, then probably the first thing we would notice is that there is something terrifying going on, actually, and that's the way we, we, we see things. I mean, the, the way the thought is working is, is, is dangerous. Or yeah, well, perhaps if there were proprioception, we wouldn't go on with this uh, insane way of proceeding, you see. Uh, the In order for it to occur, hmm. one would have to have no censoring of whatever came up. Oh, yes. And that's yes. very painful and difficult. Well, that's part of the thought process which tells you that it's painful and difficult. You see, the pain may come from the same system which is causing all the rest of the trouble. 
see, the thought process says that's going to be very painful and difficult, and therefore you will feel it, just as you feel the reality of the table, right? Hmm. Are you saying then that the human species doesn't know what it does and doesn't know how it perceives? We absolutely don't know most of the time, and there must be another way of seeing that. Yes, well, uh, see, the, the first thing is that thought itself must uh, change in some way. You see, I would like to give a sort of an image or an, an analogy. That <coughs> see, I wanted to say thought is, takes itself as very big, but maybe it's just a ripple on the stream. And the stream is the stream of consciousness, right? <laughs> so the, the stream of consciousness has to be aware of itself. Well, that's not, not, not no great thing because consciousness is just what ought to be aware, right? <laughs> so the, therefore, but can the stream of consciousness be aware of this ripple that it has produced by proprioceptively as it's aware of how it moved the body, right? <laughs> so that's somehow addressing this difficulty I've been having about understanding thought being aware of itself. It seems to make perfect sense when you describe it, but I have some notion that thought being memory can only describe, it can't be aware. But thought is also more than me memory. That's, is. That's what I mean. So you used the phrase, the movement of thought being aware of itself. Yeah. So now we're getting into this yeah, thing. The movement of, see, memory is more than memory, too, because memory is a re set of reflexes. It's a movement, right? Mm. Yeah. You see, what memory actually is, is movement, but memory is a, a, a just mere memory is a representation of something much greater, do you see? Mm -hmm. Much more. Hmm? <coughs> the word memory usually represents something as just stored up. Huh? But memory is a movement in the brain, huh? perhaps. Well, if memory is a movement, then the recording uh, conditioning, as, uh, assumptions, that's a movement too? Yeah. So the, uh, what you call conditioning or recording assumptions, taped in the memory, so that's a movement. Too. That's a movement. I would rather not say tape, but condition. You see, the, <clears throat> the tape is too mechanical an analogy, but conditioning is, is such that you can think that each time you do it, it leaves a little bit of change in the nerves, so it builds up a pattern. Hmm? It gets more and more fixed. Hmm? When you, when you say that there's a ripple on the surface, a thought is like the ripple on the sur surface of the ocean of consciousness, that makes it sound as if, in principle, it should be very simple and easy to see this ripple. But it's it, it may be, it. actually, but we don't, we're sort of, being in this mode of consciousness we are now in, this ripple seems to be everything, right? It appears, it is represented as everything and therefore perceived as everything, right? Hmm? That might be one of the mistakes, that we think it's more difficult than it yeah. actually be. It may, that may be so. You see, as we can't count on what thought tells us about how difficult it is. You see, we, you know, <laughs> it, it, thought may, doesn't know, really. <laughs> so it's best to say we don't know how difficult it is, right? You see, if, if you could be serious about that, saying that whatever thought says about this, it doesn't really know. Can you say all over again what you've been saying in a different way? Well, what part? I mean, how far back do I have to go? <laughs> this thing of proprioception functioning in the uh, thought process, the thought being aware of itself, can you approach that in some different way? Well, I don't quite see. Uh, you see, uh, thought <coughs> is now conditioned to the assumption, you know, to, to the representation of itself as in various ways. You see, saying, what, that it's different from uh, the body, it's... Uh, uh, it's, it doesn't affect perception and so on. It says it's just telling you the way things are, and therefore that is the way you perceive how thought works. Hmm? Hmm? Because thought is capable of whatever it represents can be, become how you perceive it. Now outside you have a check. <coughs> if I perceive this, uh, uh, this as a cup when it's, uh, let's say, something else, <coughs> I will soon find out by sensory experience that it's incoherent. Huh? So perceptions that are mistaken or show up as incoherence and we correct them. Hmm? But inside it's much harder because you haven't got any, you can't get hold of it, right? Hmm? See, thought is going on inside and whatever you think in the whole being is going on inside, so if thought presents itself, which is inside, presumably, 
as it isn't really because it's also the whole world, right? As, uh, as separate from perception and just telling you the way things are, the thought has this picture of how it works, right? That it, you see how things are, you see certain things, and then thought really tells you more about them, right? Hmm? Which is the way, you know, it, it draws inferences and it does nothing and has no effect. Now, that's what thought, and therefore that's the way you see it. Hmm? Now, so I say, but thought is actually doing more than that, it is affecting how you see it. Okay, so there you're saying that the thought body process is one movement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And also the perception, uh, the sense perception. Hmm? Hmm? Okay, there's awareness. <coughs> Which may, however, be sort of captured in all this system, right? Hmm. Well, okay. awareness mm -hmm. must be upstream from all of this. Uh, oh, fundamentally, yes. You see, that there, there is possible, there's available an awareness, a, con a stream of consciousness, or which is more fundamental, you know, which I imaged as being in the, in the depths of the ocean. You see, we, see if we say thought, is a representation, it's a form, right? A representation is a cer always a certain form. The rainbow is a certain form, the letters are a certain form, the artist makes a form. A representation is always a form, right? Hmm? Is that clear? But that form then becomes apparently a part of what is, huh? Hmm? Right. So, therefore, that the representation everybody can see it is hardly more than a ripple. Hmm? It, it doesn't have much substance. Anybody can see that. Is that? Hmm? But when it sort of fuses with perception, then it seems to have all the substance. The representation is an abstraction. It's a symbol. Right? Yes. Which also has its physical component. It has, but uh, but as a physical thing, it's very very tiny. You right. see, I mean, it's a few bits of ink <laughs> or something right. you know, on paper or, or some little electric current in the brain, right? Hmm? Does not have a structure. It has a structure. The form has a structure, but it has no independent uh, uh, substance and has no in inherent internal necessity. Hmm? Could you represent it as the surface, like the grotesque, and the some, you're saying there's something more subtle underneath? Yeah, but you take the surface of the ocean, all sorts of forms will appear in those waves. You see, they change this way and that way and the other way. They're very, very little to hold them, huh? Hmm? Right? There's very little in it. Huh? And then you have the depth. Now, then, but that, those forms, however, have a meaning, right, in the mind. And the whole thing is following according to that meaning, which it has to. Hmm? But, but the meaning is wrong because one of my important part of the meaning is wrong because one part is missing, namely <laughs> it should mean that that is only a, an outward form on the surface. But instead, it means that's the basic substance of what is. Hmm? Are you, is there an innuendo in that? that there are two kinds of perception, one superficial and one of essence. Well, there may be a deeper perception, I'm saying, a, a, a deeper one which starts from these depths. And there, there is a perception which is highly affected, we said, by thought. And our ordinary sense perception certainly is generally of that nature, though it may perhaps occasionally get out of it. But uh, the... Uh, uh, but what we ordinarily take to be perception, or at least what thought takes to be perception, and which is ordinarily called perception, is affected by thought, right? So we just have to say, we only have to worry at this moment about what thought is taking as the source of its information. Hmm? Is that clear? Now, thought takes sense perception as the source of its information, among other things. And that, it says, if that sense perception is just unaffected by thought, it's just telling you something, and then thought will then proceed from there. Hmm. But it may turn out that this has been affected already, <coughs> and therefore thought is taking something that it has done as, a, uh, as an independent fact. Hmm. Which 
prevents the depth perception? Well, it, it, eventually it muddles the brain up so much that it, you know, it prevents my, uh, almost everything, right? You see, because based on that fact, a lot of other things start to happen, that apparent fact. And the brain muddles up, you see. Hmm. You see, from that fact going, from that going wrong, uh, it, it spreads and it becomes a systemic fault. It spreads into everything. Hmm? Uh, are there, would you say that there's non-perception of the interference of thought? Yes. There's perception of the interference of thought, and there's no thought interfering. Yeah, those are possible states, right? Now, you see, if, uh, let's say that the thought is able to perceive, to be aware of its own uh, effects, then when it's producing effects that make no sense, it would simply stop them. You see, thought is not malicious, just trying to uh, destroy everything. But it's just doing whatever it does, apparently, according to its own mechanism. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, so, see, when, when you have proprioception of the body, you wouldn't attempt to do the sort of mistake that you would get into if you didn't have it. I mean, that like this woman got into of attacking herself, right? Hmm? But you see, when you don't proprioceive thought, if I may coin that word, then the uh, then you may start attacking yourself. Right? You, you hurt yourself. You say, I'm hurt, right? Hmm? But then, and under the impression that the attack has come from outside. So are what we're saying uh, is not a way of thinking so much as it's a way of perception. Yes, it's uh, some extension of perception, right? You see that, uh, I'm saying that perhaps that is uh, possible, such an extension of perception. Hmm. Would proprioception of thought um, take place not in what we think of as thought, but actually in the physical, since they are all the same thing? That's, that's actually the case. You see, since it's all physical, it's an extension of the ordinary proprioception into something more subtle, hmm. but still of the same general nature. Hmm. So that, that, that's the point I'm trying to make, that this distinction between thought and the physical is one of the... We, we should just draw a dotted line, but we have drawn a great big gulf between them, right? <laughs> you see, in, in our thought, and therefore we perceive them that way. Hmm? I wonder if one of the reasons that people ask to have this explained over and over again is that when you say thought being aware of its own movement, or proprioception, that the, my, my thinking makes an image of what that would be, and rather than just listening to what you're saying about thought noticing its activity, or the kind of thing it does, I start trying to make a, percep a, a description of what it would be like to be aware. Yeah, and the difficulty with that description is that it enters your perception. You see, it would be all right to describe it if you said this is a speculative description. If you said, frankly, this is a speculative attempt to imagine what it might be, but it might not be that at all. <laughs> but instead, you just start presenting it, you just represent it in the imagination, and very quickly it spreads over and becomes apparently some kind of reality, <laughs> hmm? which misleads you. Hmm? See, in other words, that very process is part of the thing, of the system, the fault in the system, the thing we just described. It's just another form of the fault. Or I, I just, I'm not able to make much of a description and I say, I can't do this. And yeah, then, but then that, that enters your perception as impossible and you will feel, a, you, you perceive a block, right? Yeah, so I'm saying in some way it seems like then I don't hear the rest of, I don't hear the simplicity of what you said. Well, if it's impossible, it's not even necessary to listen, right? You see. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you don't have to take it seriously at all, right? <laughs> you see, uh, the rest follows, right? Hmm. So, so we're not going to get out of the situation where our representations or thinking have an effect, but rather to, to be more aware of what's happening. And yeah, and also to describe it correctly when we do see what's happening. Because if we see what's happening and describe it wrongly, we will be misinforming the, the, the system about what it's doing, right? And the system will then get more confused. <laughs> See, all the information that the system has about itself affects what it does. Huh?